I'll be reading uh, from Acts chapter 5, uh, verses uh, 12 through 20, and it's on page 1698 of your pew Bible. The apostle performed many miraculous signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and their tormented by evil spirits, and all of them were healed. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. From the beginning of recorded human thought, mankind has been asking the question, what is the meaning of life? In other words, why are we here? Why do we exist? What are we supposed to be doing? What difference does it make what we do? The writer of Ecclesiastes had some of the same questions. What good is there in any of the things that we do? If we're going to die anyway, then why bother to work hard and establish yourself? Why do more than you have to when in the end there's no meaning to your labor or to your pleasure or to your wealth or to your wisdom? What is life anyway? Webster's Dictionary defines life this way. The quality or character distinguishing an animal or a plant from inorganic or from dead organic bodies, which is especially manifested by metabolism, growth, reproduction, and internal power of adaptation to environment. Now that makes life sound exciting, doesn't it? Basically, the definition of life is just not being dead. Most of us want something more out of life than that, don't we? But for many people, that's pretty much all life is, just not being dead. And if that's all life is, then you're not really alive to begin with, are you? When the Bible talks about life, it's not talking about life as you usually think of it. It's talking about something different than how we usually think of life. In the Bible, life is timeless. It's not limited to that period of time between when you're born and when you die. In fact, in the biblical way of thinking, life is something that is unique to the Christian experience. If you're not a Christian, you're not really alive. There was something about the quality of the life of the early church members that set them apart from everybody else. Their lives were so radically different than what society was used to that they literally changed their society, which is what they were called to do. In the passage that Dave read for us, we see that people reacted to the life and to the work of the apostles in three different ways. One is that they became believers. Verse 14 says that more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Back in Acts 2, verse 41, we see that on one day alone, that 3,000 people were converted. People responded to the witness of the apostles, and they wanted the kind of life that they had. Or if they didn't immediately become believers, many were at least curious about this message. Verse 13 tells us that the apostles were highly regarded by the people. And verses 15 and 16 tell us that the crowds of people were intrigued by the apostles. And uh, they, they just came to see what was going on with them. They even put their mats on, on the, where Peter's shadow might cross over them. They were really curious about what might happen. And uh, they brought their sick to them and were told that all of them were healed. And I'm going to imagine that eventually many of this second group of curious people became a part of the first group of believers. Either that or they became a part of the third group, which was people who were threatened by the apostles. Particularly, the leaders of the community were threatened by and they were jealous of the life of the apostles. Notice that the same kind of people who opposed and who were threatened by Jesus Christ would naturally be in opposition to the apostles. 
the, their self-absorption and their jealousy would not permit them to be attracted to the life and the truth that was presented to them by the apostles. And so, because they had the authority to do so, they had the apostles thrown into jail. Now, at other times in Bible history, and for God's own reasons, God had allowed for his servants to remain in prison. Not this time. God just wanted to get things started here with this, this new living organism called the church. And he wanted the apostles out in the world doing the work that they had been called to do. And so that very night, he sent an angel to release them from prison. Now, I'm sure that alone would have been verification enough for the apostles to know that what they were doing was right, and they were to continue doing it. Then the angel spoke to them, and he challenged them with what is really the central message and the mission of the church today. Verse 20 says, go, stand in the temple courts and tell the people the full message of this new life. Now, the original language, the, the Greek does not actually have the word for new in there, but rather it uses an emphatic way of, of using the word life. So it's kind of hard to translate it. It's not just life we're talking about. It's something different. It's not just about being alive. It's not just a particular lifestyle or a philosophy of living, but it's a special kind of life. Some translations might have the word life capitalized there, or some say the, the full message of this life. Go and tell people about life, this new special life that we have in Jesus Christ. Now, as I said before, the Bible talks about life in a different way than just our existence on earth. 36 times the word life is used in the New Testament in reference to Christ and to his work. So in order to understand life, you have to understand Christ. You have to know him. First of all, the word life is used as a synonym for Jesus. Jesus is life. If we are to go and tell people about this life, then we have to start by telling them about Jesus, for he is life. And that's what the witness of the apostles was. 1 John 1, 1 says, that which was from the beginning, we've talked about this at Christmas time, Jesus was from the beginning, not just coming into existence as a baby born in a manger, but he was from the beginning, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, the disciples heard him with their own ears, which we have seen with our eyes, they walked with him and talked with him, which we have looked at and with our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we've seen it, and we testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. When you come to know Jesus, you come to know life. Without Christ, there is no life. When Jesus appeared, life appeared. So Jesus is life. But secondly, the word life is used to describe not only who Jesus was, but what he came to do. He disclosed himself three different times in terms of the word life. And I'm sure you, you remember these. First of all, so I'm the bread of life, the basis of nurture and of sustenance of this new life is Jesus Christ. That's where it comes from. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. The source of life that transcends this earthly existence that ends with death is all found in Jesus Christ. Life with Jesus is more than just this earthly existence. It's a resurrection into a new life. And of course, I know you, that you know, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the way to God, the way. He is the truth about God, the only truth. And he is the life of God. And he then sums it up, the whole purpose in John 10, 10, when he says, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. This abundant life is a whole new level of existence. It goes beyond plant and animal life and even normal human life. But it's talking about a whole other dimension of life. Jesus came so that we can have this life. It's only possible through him. Okay, so first of all, Jesus is life. Next, he came to bring life. And then the third way that the word life is used in reference to Christ is that it is symbolic of what happens to the individual who receives Christ as Savior. John put it very simply in 1 John 5, 12. He who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son does not have life. Can't get any more plain than that, can you? In other words, if you don't have Christ, you're not really alive. You're still dead in your sins. You're just temporarily existing. 
Paul expressed what this meant to him when he said in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus gives life because he is life. And I'm not just talking about future glory and eternity in heaven, how as wonderful as that is, but I'm talking about this new dimension of life starting right here and now. Someone once said, fear not that your life will come to an end, but rather that it shall never have a beginning. Life has a new beginning when we have Jesus, and everything is different. The old has passed away, we're told in 1 Corinthians. The, the, the new has come. We're new creations. And if we have that new life, then it will be evident. We won't be able to help but to go tell it on the mountain, to go stand and to speak about what this life is all about. Lloyd John Ogilvy, in his book, Drumbeat of Love, says, our task is not to argue, philosophize, speculate, or cajole, but to live a life that demands explanation. Is there anything about us that would force people to say, now that is living. That's how I want to live. That's the way I wish I could be. When we consider sharing our faith as imparting life to people, that makes a whole difference in our approach to doing that. Then the emphasis is on Christ and not on our theories or, or on our theology about him that we try to, to force on people. Very interesting thought to me. If we experience this, this life as Christ meant, us to, meant for us to experience, then our life is going to demand an explanation. People will have to react to us, and they're probably going to react to us the same way they did to the apostles. Either they will become believers, or they will at least become curious and ask some questions, or they will be threatened by us, and they will react strongly against us. Do you get any of these reactions? Have you been able to lead someone else to the Lord through your encounters with people? There's no greater thing on earth to be able to do that. Have you at least had some people ask you questions and wonder about why you believe what you believe and, and, and why you live the way you do? Have you had people react strongly in opposition to you because of your lifestyle? See, if the church is really going to be the church, then it better be prepared for persecution because that is one definite reaction that this kind of life that Jesus is and the kind of life that he came to give us is going to, to, to bring out in people. It's one way to know whether you're really living the life that God has called you to live. Are you getting any flack about it? Or is your faith so secretive and so private that it doesn't threaten anybody? Now, it shouldn't threaten everybody. <laughs> if all you're getting is negative reactions, then maybe you better look at how you come across to people. But if you are living this life, you are bound to get a variety of reactions. The apostles did what they were told to do, what they were told by God to do, and not what they were told by the religious leaders. They went and they told people about this life. And so, therefore, they got arrested again, and they were brought before the Sanhedrin. Peter's answer to the Sanhedrin speaks very clearly that there are requirements of all of us being able to, to speak this, this life in Christ. Verse 27 says, Having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, well, duh. No, he didn't say that. He said, he said we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior, that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. The first requirement of sharing life in Christ is that of courage. Peter said, we must obey God rather than men. Easy thing to say, but not so easy to do, is it? Each one of us, we have our, our loyalties, we have our securities in this world that are very important to us, family, friends, possessions, employment, <laughs> reputation. But to live the life that Christ has called us to live and given us to live, God must be more important to us than any of those things. And it takes tremendous courage to obey God rather than men. We must ask ourselves, can I really say that? Am I ready to say that, that 
God's more important to me than, than all of the, the things that this world tells me should be important. The second requirement is clarity. Peter once again used this interrogation and this imprisonment as an opportunity to share the basic essentials of the gospel story. I love how he did that. Just a few sentences. He made it clear to them. Jesus died. Jesus rose again. Jesus is exalted. Jesus offers forgiveness for those who repent of their sins. Now, if you can get those things across in a timely way like Peter did, you've done a pretty good job of witnessing. So often we just get so caught up in all the theology and all the arguments and all the debates when we just need to put that simple word out. Jesus died. He rose again. We have forgiveness in his name. He is exalted in heaven. As a pastor who fancies himself as somewhat of a theologian, I myself tend to get, just get too caught up in doctrines and, and interpretations and things that are very interesting to me, but simply not as significant as the simple clarity of the gospel. Jesus gave his life for us so that he could give his life to us. And the third requirement is that of confidence. Peter said with confidence in verse 32, we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. He's saying, listen to us. We know. We know what we're talking about. See, if you're not so sure about your life in Christ and, and what has happened to you when you accepted Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior, it shows. You know, others can sense your uncertainty. But when you know what's happened to you, that you've been given life, then you can have the confidence to share that life with others. That confidence makes a difference. I'm not talking about arrogance. I'm not talking about talking to others with condescension, but with just plain confidence that you know that what you are saying is true and that others would be so much better off if they believed it as well. And then the last requirement is a condition. I use that word because it starts with C like the other words, but the word I want to get to is the condition is obedience. Peter said that the Holy Spirit is given by God to those who obey. Obedience is the secret to spiritual strength. The power of the Holy Spirit is released to you when you obey the Lord. It's really not about how much you know or how much you say or how much you do, but rather it's about whether you obey. To obey God rather than to obey men means to make that distinction between performance and obedience. In uh, the magazine Discipleship Journal, Susan Masonick writes, the line between obedience and performance can be a blurry one. Yet it is an important distinction to grasp because obedience leads to life and performance to death. She makes these comparisons. Obedience is seeking God with your whole heart. Performance is having a quiet time because you'll feel guilty if you don't. Obedience is finding ways to let the word of God dwell in you richly. Performance is quickly scanning a passage so you can check it off your Bible reading plan. Obedience is inviting guests to your home for dinner. Performance is feeling anxious about whether every detail of the meal will be perfect. Obedience is following God's prompting to start a small group. Performance is reluctance to let anyone else lead the group because they may not do it as well as you would. Obedience is doing your best. Performance is wanting to be the best. Obedience is saying yes to whatever God asks of you. Performance is saying yes to whatever people ask of you. Obedience is following the promptings of God's spirit. Performance is following a list of man-made requirements. Obedience springs from fear of God. Performance springs from fear of failure. See, if we say no to what God is telling us to do through his commandments or through the urging of his Holy Spirit, then we just cannot expect the joy and the energy and the life that comes from the infilling of the Holy Spirit. A lot of people want to set the world on fire for Jesus, but they're not willing to obey his commandments. See, just one demonstration of disobedience can ruin your testimony and can undo all the word that you may have previously said to try to bring someone else to Christ. But because of the apostles' courage and their clarity, their confidence and their obedience, there was power in this new life that they spoke about. The Sanhedrin wanted to kill the apostles, but they were afraid of that power as well they should have been. 
but still they had them flogged, a terrible and painful punishment, and they let them go, but ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus. Well, what do you suppose they did? Not sure what I would do if I'd been flogged and told not to go say something. But what would this new amazing life have them do? Verse 41 says, The apostles left the Sanhedrin, rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. This is true life, and we can experience life in the same way, abundantly, joyfully. It's seldom easy. It is difficult. It's hard when people don't respond to you the way that, that you want them to. It's hard when they react negatively towards you. It takes courage to live the life. But when you live differently, people are going to notice and they will demand an explanation. They're going to ask questions at least. Why don't you drink? Why don't you swear like everybody else I know? You know why do you go to church all the time? And what opportunities then come up for you to share simply why you live the way you do? It takes courage. It takes clarity. Know what you need to say, when you need to say it. Put it briefly, succinctly, so that they can understand it. It takes confidence. You have to know what you believe and, and be able to, to have that confidence in it. And it takes that condition of obedience in your own personal life. It isn't easy. Nobody said it's easy, but it's worth it. And the only way to experience this kind of life is to know Jesus and to center your life on him. That's why he is the reason for this season. That's why he is the message of this life. 